In this lecture, we'll be looking at how to use Facebook AI's similarity search library. Note that there are many, many alternatives in order to do similarity search or semantic search, but we won't be covering all of them in this course. The Facebook library is relatively new and serves our purposes, and I've never covered it in any of my previous courses. So I thought this would be a good course to introduce it. I do want to briefly mention some alternatives that you could try out in your own projects or at work. One option is to just use SciKit-Learn, which has a nearest neighbors class. The advantage of SciKit-Learn is that it supports many different kinds of distances. Another option is to use vector databases, which are databases specifically designed for vector similarity search. Some examples are Pinecone and Milvis. The final option I want to mention is databases that weren't designed specifically to be vector databases, but have vector similarity search as added functionality. I like this option because these databases have been around for a long time, and so have a large user base along with battle-tested software. Some examples include Postgres and Redis. Okay, so let's get into the hairy details of how to use Facebook's similarity search library. To begin, you'll want to install the library using the usual pip install command. Note that there are two versions, face CPU and face GPU. You'll need an NVIDIA GPU if you want to use the GPU version. Since I'm on a Mac, I'll be using the CPU version in this course. But if you're on Colab or you have a local NVIDIA GPU, then please feel free to try out the GPU version. Inside Python, you'll want to begin by importing the face library like so. The next step is to create an index by calling face.index flat L2. This is where you pass in the dimensionality of the vectors you'll be using. For the purpose of this course, we'll stick with L2 distance, although others are possible, such as the inner product distance. The inner product distance is similar to cosine distance, except that the inner product isn't normalized. The cosine distance is essentially the same as the inner product distance, but normalized by the lengths of the vectors. There is some discussion on the face GitHub repository about why they decided not to include the cosine distance explicitly, so you can check that out if you're interested. At the same time, this isn't too useful for us anyway, because when your vectors are normalized, which they will be in this course, using L2 distance is equivalent to using cosine distance anyway. You can prove this mathematically, as I did in my original NLP course, but the details are outside the scope of this course. As a challenge, you might want to try to show this yourself. The next step is to add the vectors you want to search at a later time. This can be done by calling the add function. Note that there are some restrictions to the type of data that you can pass in. For example, you must pass in a two-dimensional array of shape n by d, where n is the number of vectors and d is the vector dimensionality. The object you pass in must have the shape parameter, since this will be called by the library. So, for example, you cannot pass in a list of lists, even though that would work with libraries like scikit-learn and TensorFlow. The final step is to actually use your vector index to make queries. To do this, call the index.search function, passing in the query vector, and the number of neighbors you want back. Note that the search function also requires the input query vector to be two-dimensional. This is even the case when you only have one query vector. So instead of passing in a one-dimensional vector of size d, you must pass in a two-dimensional vector of size 1 by d. This presumably means that you can do multiple queries at the same time, although we won't try this in the coming lecture. It's important to understand the return values for this function. In particular, it returns a 2D array of distances and a 2D array of corresponding indices. The distances are just the actual distances between the query vector and the retrieved vectors returned by the search. The indices tell you where in your original data set of vectors these matches can be found, of course, in corresponding order. So the first element will contain the closest item, the second element will contain the second closest item, and so forth. As such, you'll need to always have information about your original vectors on hand to look up the actual data you're looking for before it was converted into a vector.
In this lecture, we'll be looking at OpenAI's embeddings endpoint. Throughout this course, we've been looking at the chat completions endpoint, but this one is totally new. The chat completions endpoint takes in text and returns text, but this endpoint takes in text and returns a list of numbers, otherwise known as a vector. Although I'm going to show you the code for this in the lectures, I wanted to have this dedicated lecture as a reference to isolate this particular functionality. So how does it work? Let's assume we've imported OpenAI and created our client object. Let's also assume we have some text we want to embed in a variable called text. Then all we need to do is call the function client.embeddings.create. This will take in two parameters, namely input and model. Input is where you pass in your text. Note that this must be a list of strings, so you cannot pass in a string directly. This format allows you to pass in multiple texts at once to be converted into vectors. The model input is a string that tells OpenAI which model you want to use. We'll be using a model called Text Embedding 3 Small. There is a large version as well, which costs a bit more. As always, you'll need to run your own tests to see what works best for your particular use case. Concerning the return value, as with other OpenAI endpoints, this will be an object which contains the actual data as an attribute. When you retrieve this data, note that it will be a list of floats, rather than a NumPy array, as you might have become accustomed to if you do machine learning and data science in Python. It might be okay to leave this as is, depending on which libraries you want to use downstream. But for us, we'll need to convert these into arrays.